Right, welcome everyone. Uh, good morning, uh, afternoon or night, depending on where you are today with this webinar. Uh, my name is Pedro Dos Santos. I'm a uh, associate professor of political science at the College of St. Benedictine and St. John's University in Minnesota. Uh, this will be um, a side event for the Commission Status of Women uh, Conference um, on Women's Political Representation. Uh, this was uh, sponsored by Blue Ridge Impact Consult Consulting and co-sponsored by Virginia Tech. Uh, so we're going to have a conversation today about uh, women's full and effective participation in decision making in public life, including political participation. Um, and I'm gonna introduce our, our panelists. Uh, and after the introduction, uh, we'll have a brief remarks from each panelist, uh, and then we're gonna open up to questions. Uh, we'll have some questions that we uh, uh, had from, uh, from those who registered and asked questions already, but also feel free to ask questions on the chat. Um, uh, we will be able to uh, try to answer those, as many as, as possible. So again, the goal here is to, uh, um, have an open conversation about these uh, issues related to women's political participation and representation all over the world. Uh, and we have uh, uh, four uh, uh, specialists in the area here that can talk to us about, um, about these this issues. Um, and so let's go ahead and start. Uh, I'll give you a quick introduction for each of them. Uh, and then uh, we can start a conversation. Um, so first, uh, uh, we're going to have Dr. Farida Jalalzai. Uh, uh, she's going to be talking about heads of state and government. Uh, Dr. Jalalzai is Associate Dean of Global Initiatives and Engagement at the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences uh, and Professor at Virginia Tech. Um, then we're going to talk, uh, Dr. Tiffany Barnes will talk about cabinets. Uh, Dr. Barnes is a social professor of political science at the University of Kentucky, uh, where she's also the director of undergraduate studies. Uh, and she was just awarded uh, uh, NSF grant uh, with uh, her co-PI, uh, Diana um, Sorry, I forgot Diana's last name, uh, Diana O'Brien. <laughs> um, uh, women as leaders, policymakers, and symbols in the inner cabinet. Uh, so she'll be able to kind of share a little bit about that as well. Then we'll go, Dr. Amina Zia was going to be talking about political parties. Uh, Dr. Zia is a social impact consultant and UN representative for the Equal Sock Civil Society Network. Uh, and then we have Dr. Malaga Oak uh, uh, talking about women in the legislature. Uh, uh, Dr. Oak is a uh, uh, social professor of global studies at Idaho State University. So I will uh, thank you all for being here again. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, and I will uh, give uh, the floor to Dr. Jalalzai. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. I'm gonna just quickly try to share my screen. So my area of expertise is women executives defined as presidents and prime ministers. And what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about some of the trends that exist um, regarding the numbers of women and also where they've come into positions geographically. But what I wanna do is work my way to this discussion about what it matters or why it matters to have women at the helm. And so to begin, I just updated these numbers over the weekend. <laughs> and so what we know is that women have definitely increased their representation in terms of at least being present as prime ministers and presidents. And what this figure shows is that about 57% of, of women in the sample are prime ministers and 43% are presidents. When I started first doing this topic, that was a number that was way lower. And I have a graphic in a moment that shows you over time, women definitely increasing their numbers. But what we've had are definitely some of these longstanding patterns of women having maybe more representation as prime ministers than presidents. And that's not because there are more positions available as far as prime ministers. There are actually more um, presidencies than there are prime ministers and women have typically gained more ground as prime ministers. And we can talk about reasons why that might be the case. Another interesting thing is that often when I update these numbers around this time every year because of Women's History Month, um, what we actually find is that there aren't a whole lot of, of increases in women's presence in a lot of new countries. What you actually have are some of the same countries where women have cracked the glass ceiling having maybe their second case, third case, perhaps even their fourth or fifth case at this point. And so this time when I was updating my numbers for this last year, 
there were six more cases of women, but only one new place where a woman held power. I want to say off the top of my head that was in Togo. Um, another thing, if you look at this slide um, that you'll note, is that women really didn't have a whole lot of, of gains that they made. So back in the 1960s, very few women, they were the wives of former leaders in Asia, for example. Um, you had over time, more women coming into positions of power. And really once you get to the 2000s, there have been major gains. And I wanna say in the new year, there's only been one additional case of women uh, of a woman leader coming to office, but you're seeing like a tripling or quadrupling of, of women's numbers. Geographically, they come into positions everywhere. And that was the case from the very beginning, places that you wouldn't necessarily expect. But definitely because there's more countries, of course, in Europe, and also many positions, if you're looking at presidencies and prime ministerships, Europe has been really one of the, the leading places where you'll see women. And one of the things at the same time, it, what's a different pattern is that in the past, it was women who would come in from Western Europe. And you're actually seeing a lot of cases now of women who are, are heads of state or government in places that were perhaps part of the former communist stronghold. And so places in Central and Eastern Europe are now becoming just as common for women to break through as in Western Europe. And in other places like Latin America, women definitely had increased their presence. And at the same time, when we can point to a, a point in time when women were, I think there were four, there were definitely four women presidents in power at the same time. As soon as that pattern took hold, it kind of broke down. And you'd actually, you actually don't see women's presence as presidents in Latin America right now. And then other areas representing places like New Zealand or Australia. So that's what it looks like regionally. Um, and if you were to look at the, the women in power right now, again, as, as presidents all over the map. And I should also say that this is, in, this is counting um, leaders of autonomous countries, um, independent countries recognized by the UN. Um, and if you, were to, if you were to have a walk away from this, it's really that they come to power in many places that perhaps you wouldn't expect because of perhaps cultural reasons or women's success in you know, other realms like education attainment or professional integration. And so they're coming into positions of power in the Caribbean, Central and Eastern Europe, and you in Asia as well. And at the same time, you have to be aware of the extent to which women have real power. And so there's quite a few women on this list that are more ceremonial presidents, as in Singapore, for example, or in Nepal. And one of the, there are two, I think, things that you could look at as a shortcut to determining whether or not a woman had real power is whether, number one, um, they're elected or unelected. And a lot of times when you're more of a ceremonial president, not always is this the case, but a lot of the time, you don't actually get into power through popular election. And then I don't have partisanship up here, but often when a person lacks a party, it means that they're really entrusted more with being a unifier and aren't really there to, to forge a policy agenda, for example. And I should also note that some women are in positions of power only temporarily um, as acting or interim presidents, as, as is the case in Bolivia. Um, if you turn to prime ministers, you have about 15 in office right now, some who we I think we've seen, you know, as some of the most visible players, for example, Angela Merkel in Germany, and just like their counterparts in the presidency, there's a lot of power differences among um, heads of government. And so if I were to look at a generalization in Africa, often where you have prime ministers in Africa, you're really not looking at someone who's a traditional prime minister in a parliamentary system. And often it's the case that the president in the system who are very rarely women in African countries um, really is still both the head of state and head of government. Um, but then you have other examples as is the case in Germany or in Norway where no, the woman who has the prime ministership 
is the dominant force policy wise. Um, so I was saying that women have had a lot of gains and this is true. Far, far more women today are executives than they were, for example, in the early 2000s or in 1990. But if you look at all of the men in power, women are still just a very small segment of those who are governing. And so only 6% right now. And so if we're gonna ask this question of what difference does it make? Well, what difference does it make when you have very few women in the room? And I'll, I'll try to tease apart what, what matters about that. I don't have time to really go through this next slide. And so I'll address most of these areas during the Q&A, but definitely if you were to compare political institutions as a factor to more societal characteristics like the percentage of women in education uh, for, you know, so the percentage of women who are educated or have attained bachelor's degrees or something equivalent to that or master's degrees, you have a lot more leverage. I think that's gained when you look at political institutions like du dual executive systems, where if you have both a prime ministership and a presidency, the odds are that women are able to gain one of the positions more than if they there was like one presidential position available um, through the popular vote, as is the case in the United States. Um, and then when you look at other factors like the percentage of women who've, who've attained higher education, those don't really work in intuitive ways. Um, that it doesn't mean that if you have more women who are in the professions that that means you're going to have a woman president or prime minister. Um, where you see some interesting findings is that certainly we've had a lot of women coming into positions during transitional times um, or in contexts that were very unstable and women were entrusted to try to bring together the country again in, in times of, of instability. Um, family ties has factored into an explanation, especially in the past in Asia and not and until recently was the case in Latin America. Um, and one of the greatest actual factors in, in predicting whether or not a country is going to have a future woman leader is if they've had one in the past. There's a strong pull, I think, to future cases. Um, I'll talk more about media coverage, I think, in the Q&A. Um, and then why it matters. Why does it matter to have women? This is an older picture um, in 2016. So the, the heads of state in government that are representing their countries on the world stage at the G20. Hardly any women. And by the way, that was a good year for women as heads of, heads of state and government. So what would that picture look like now? Um, so very male dominated. So we can talk about just women's role model effects. Um, so when you see women in power, how it could inspire some to think that politics is open to women or that the system is more inclusive and democratic and more just and you could trust the system more. Um, if you were to see um, that, so back when Hillary Clinton was running for the Democratic nomination, she was the only woman on the stage. And then you fast forward to a time when Hillary, Hillary Clinton, you know, we had the example of a woman um, gaining the, the Democratic Party nomination. And then you had six women who ran the next time. And so the role model effects. Um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf saying that as the former president of Liberia, that she was, in, she was in a position that could help inspire other women to hold executive leadership posts or, or go into other positions that could be springboards. Um, the hope, especially that smaller, um, so children, young girls, the, the effects that that could have where they, they don't know what time where there wasn't a female vice president, for example, in, in the case of Kamala Harris. And also the possibility, um, some of my research focuses on their tendency to bring other women into positions of power through the powers of their appointment. Um, and policy empowerment is important. So be, bringing in views that aren't usually integrated in, in the political sphere. Um, and a couple of quotes here as well. So in the case of the prime minister of Iceland saying it's important to have all genders at the table and it affects the way that you think and the, then different decisions are made. And the last slide really, um, Jacinda Ardern who's gotten a lot of positive press as the prime minister of New Zealand, a country that has had three female prime ministers. 
To me, leadership is not necessarily about being the loudest in the room, but instead being a bridge or the thing that's missing in the discussion and trying to build a consensus from there. And one of the leaders along with her female counterpart in Iceland, you know, who has done well in handling the COVID crisis. Um, and so that's, those are my thoughts and I'm happy to take your questions after the full panel has gone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jalalzai. Um, so we'll uh, move on to uh, Dr. Tiffany Barnes uh, and, and she'll be talking about uh, women in cabinet positions. Great, thank you. Um, can you see my screen okay? Wonderful. So my name is Tiffany Barnes and I'm an associate professor at the University of Kentucky. And today I'm going to be sharing just a little bit of information with you about women in uh, cabinet positions. And specifically, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about when women in the inner cabinet. And so I wanted to start off by um, looking at some of the gains that we've seen for women in cabinets um, in recent years. So in the last decade, women have made major gains in terms of their access to cabinet appointments worldwide. So as of January 2019, um, we saw that a, women held um, about 20% of cabinet positions worldwide. And so just to put this into comparison, um, women hold about 24% of seats in parliaments worldwide. So um, their representation closely mirrors that of their access to parliaments. Um, and this is good news for a couple of reasons, which I'm gonna talk about um, later in the presentation. But um, we can also see that women have made slight gains in the last 10 years. So um, really just from 2010 to 2019, we only saw about a 3% increase. Um, so it's, stabled off somewhat, but um, when we look back over time, it used to be the case that cabinets were completely male dominated and it was very rare for women to have access to cabinets. But today what we see is that more and more um, heads of government are paying attention to women's access to cabinets. And it's becoming more common that heads of government are feeling pressure to include at least some women in their cabinets. And in fact, one of the trends that we've seen um, more recently in the last five years or so is that we've seen a larger number of heads of government adopting uh, gender parity cabinets or trying to increase um, women's representation by having the same number of women in office in the cabinet that they do men. And so um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of data on this. It's definitely not the norm, but it's becoming more common. And the other big gain that I think we've seen recently is that we're starting to see discussions about women's representation focus on diversity more broadly, as opposed to just thinking about how many women are in the cabinet. So we're also starting to see heads of government and politicians think about who the women are and what groups those women represent. So just to give you a snapshot of information about gender parity cabinets, um, we can see that as of 2019, there were about 20 countries worldwide that had more than 40% women in their cabinet. Um, so as I said before, this is definitely not the norm, but it is um, breaking with previous trends wherein women used to be really just token positions in, in cabinets. And, um, even more recently, since this data in 2019, um, we've had two, two cabinets that have really made um, big global headlines for their diversity in terms of cabinets. So President Joe Biden um, recently appointed a cabinet in the United States where 48% of his cabinet appointments were women and 55% of his cabinet appointments were non-white people. And this was important because it um, included a very large number of non-white women. And so for the first time, we've really started to move away from just an emphasis in the United States of having um, women in the cabinet to having women from different groups in society represented in the cabinet. And of course, um, this puts the US um, on par with other global leaders in terms of women's representation. And for those of you who might be familiar with women's representation in the United States, this is a huge leap for the United States because the United States has long lagged behind other developed democracies in terms of women's representation and either even other developing countries in terms of women's representation. So the United States has not been a global leader in this regard um, 
by any measure, but uh, Joe Biden has taken a major step in the right direction to bringing the United States back um, on par with other uh, countries. The other cabinet that really stands out in this regard um, that was recently appointed was a cabinet by uh, Jacinda Ardern, her newest cabinet. Um, it was considered by most measures, uh, perhaps the most diverse cabinet in history. So although it only included 40% women, um, it also included a large number of racial and ethnic minorities um, and also members of the LGBTQI community. And so um, she really stood out in this respect. And so right now, um, these cabinets are kind of um, worth drawing attention to because they focus on um, not just women, but also the appointment of non-white women or women from minority groups within society. But really, this is an area where we don't have reliable data to look more systematically across cases. So this is an area where we need more data collection and need more attention for research moving forward to understand not just the gender composition of cabinets across the globe, but also diversity more broadly. So we've seen then that um, women have made um, big gains throughout history, and now um, they, they make up about 20% of cabinet posts worldwide. But it's important to acknowledge that women are still underrepresented, right? So gender parity is not the norm by any stretch of the imagination. And um, women still hold less than a quarter of all cabinet positions worldwide. So two of the trends I want to point out is that um, there's substantial variation in terms of the cabinets that women gain access to, and also the portfolios that women gain access to. So more research has focused on variation in the cabinets that women gain access to. And what we see is that um, one thing is simply the passage of time is a really good predictor. The longer a country's been um, a democracy, they're more likely to have uh, women in the cabinet. But also uh, women in parliament is a really good predictor of women's access. And so I mentioned earlier that Women hold about 24% of parliamentary seats worldwide and about 20% of cabinet posts worldwide. And this is important that women's access to parliamentary seats is a strong predictor of women's access to cabinets. And the reason for this is because as we're gonna hear about later um, from our presenters, um, countries have started to adopt policy measures that are intended to increase women's representation in parliaments. And since we can address this problem with institutional measures that um, work with um, that work quite well at increasing women's access to parliaments. This is a good sign for the future of women's access to cabinet portfolios. The other place where we see huge variation, though, is not just geographic variation across the world, but also we see a lot of variation in terms of the portfolios that women gain access to. So um, I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about this in, in the next four minutes of, of my um, time to have the floor. So women tend to be disproportionately appointed to cabinet portfolios that traditionally focus on feminine issue domains. So this graph here just gives you a snapshot from um, 2019. And we can see um, the trend. I don't know if you can uh, read it very well, but I'll just describe it to you. The trend is that, um, when we look at cabinets like social affairs or family, children, youth, elderly and disabled affairs, um, environmental affairs, women's affairs, culture, we see that there is a large number of women represented in these cabinet portfolios. But as we make our way down the list and look at the bottom, these are places where women rarely gain access. And in particular, the trend tends to be that women are rarely gaining access to what we might think of as traditionally masculine portfolios or things like defense and finance and foreign affairs. And so this is an area that my research has really started to give a lot of attention to, to explain, well, when is it that women are gaining access to these historically um, or traditionally masculine portfolios from which they've historically been excluded? So um, along with some of my co-authors, I've collected some data on women's access to foreign affairs, finance and defense. And we're currently expanding our data to also include um, women's access to home affairs or interior appointments. And so this graph um, shows you a couple of different trends for the foreign affairs, finance and defense cabinets. One thing you can see is that um, there's huge variation in terms of the regions that women gain access. So whereas women are rarely gaining access to these portfolios in uh, the Middle East, in Asia and the Pacific, and even in the Americas to a large extent, women are far more likely to gain access to these positions throughout Europe and Central Asia, and also slightly more likely um, in 
sub-Saharan Africa. But the other big trend that we can see in this graph is that most of these gains have been in the last two decades. So when we look before the 1980s, even throughout the 1980s and the 1990s, women were rarely appointed to the foreign affairs, finance, or defense portfolio. And only in recent years have women started to gain access. Um, and just to put this in perspective, even though we see a large number of women finance ministers overall, when we look at this figure, for example, it can be misleading because it's, people may walk away with the understanding that lots of women throughout time have gained access to this portfolio. But the reality is that, for example, between 1990 and 2017, there were about 2,260 finance ministers worldwide but only 120 of these were women. So women held this portfolio less than 5% of the time. Um, so we wanna understand when women gain access to these places. And I'm just gonna um, briefly show you some findings that we have from the defense portfolio and also from the finance, and then I'll yield the floor. So um, in particular, we find that women are more likely to gain access to the defense portfolio in places where the portfolio has become less masculine and less conflict centered. So in places where the portfolio focuses on promulgating peace and restoring human rights, as opposed to um, invoking international military disputes or in places ruled by military dictatorships. We also find that women are more likely to gain access to these portfolios when there's a woman head of government and when there's more women in parliament. In the finance ministry, um, we find that women are more likely to gain access to finance during times of crises. In particular, women are more likely to be appointed um, following a major banking crisis, domestic debt default, or inflation crises. And women are also more likely to be appointed to these um, portfolios after big increases in corruption. And so there's still more work to be done to understand where women are gaining access. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about this work and um, some other patterns that I found in my research. Um, but for now, I'm going to turn it over to um, my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barnes. Um, and so now we're gonna switch to a discussion on political parties uh, and Dr. Amina Zia is gonna take us. Thank you. Um, so I'm very appreciative of this dialogue today because we're sharing our observations and data and recommendations on women's political representation. And we know that women's um, participation in the public life uh, is at the center of achieving inclusive societies. And when we refer to the public life and the public spaces, I want to highlight that the preamble of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which was adopted in 1979, by the UN General Assembly uh, still serves as the International Bill of Rights for Women, which was instituted in 1981 and also ratified by 189 countries from around the world. And it recognizes that discrimination against women um, as an obstacle to women's participation on equal terms with men in the political sphere, in the economic life, and also in the cultural area. And so with this year's CSW priority theme, um, which specifically looks at the full and effective participation of women, um, I, I feel that this conversation around the uh, the leadership roles for women um, and the visibility of women in public spaces is, is very crucial to the conversation. Um, and so we know that women's access to the, politic, to the public space is essential, right, in ensuring women's inclusion and engagement. And there are a wide range of issues that um, are critical to women and, and girls' lives and well-being across you know, the sustainable development goals that were laid out by the United Nations and were adopted uh, by over 180 countries from around the world in 2015. And these include, of course, maternal mor uh, uh, mortality, women's access to the internet, and other variables that also suggest that there is a very dismal state of uh, gender equality. And unfortunately, there is no country in the world that has achieved the promise of gender equality. Um, and as when it comes to women's participation in political leadership, we know that data reveals that women are struggling to reach the highest ranks of political power around the world, as our panelists have already um, indicated. And you know, women lack that access to leadership positions in almost all countries across, uh, and also across all income levels and in all regions. And we are in 2021, we find ourselves in 2021, and it is still striking that no country in the world is close to parity on crucial 
indicators of women's access to political leadership. And of course, this again, uh, reinforces the importance of looking beyond just a measure of women in political offices when we assess how society is doing in terms of women's ability to lead. We also need to look at a more expansive view that covers the range of it covers a range of you know gaps in women's political leadership around the world, including in executive, uh, legislative, and judicial avenues, uh, and, and specifically also in the corporate, um, and private sector, and within civil society engagement. So, um, you know, building on what all the panelists have already uh, highlighted and contributed to the discussion today, I do want to point to um, the conversation around women's leadership that. Might must include political parties. So my research work looks at the role of political parties. We know that political parties, like other organizations, pursue you know, very established and strategic operational goals. And their primary aim is to also maximize election support and their success rates all depend entirely on the ability um, uh, to adapt to the environments and of course this varies across party systems and regions um, but I also want to point out that this is exactly the same concept that applies to women's political participation so while political parties play a very vital role in bringing women forward uh, to political leadership and, elect and the electoral offices, these structured organizations also can serve as barriers and do serve as barriers to women's leadership. Um, parties and party leadership are the essential gatekeepers of political hierarchy and certainly um, for women's leadership. And I do want to point out that the gender gaps um, that do exist when examining women's political leadership, uh, you know, reflect that women are far more likely than men to see structural barriers and uneven expectations that hold women back from these positions. Women usually have to work twice as hard to prove themselves. And there are examples of gender discrimination, which um, is also regarded as a major obstacle to female, to women's leadership across society. There are traditional ways to measure women's engagement in political leadership. And that is usually um, by looking at the number of women in office, um, uh, women in office or the number of women who contest elections. However, there are other variables that are also are important to examine that I believe go beyond just the narrow view of women's ability to engage within a political system. Um, and, you know, uh, and there are different types of, of ways uh, and offices to gain powerful positions. And my research work focuses on women's participation in Pakistan's National Assembly um, and the party formation, the party structures, and in that context. And we can have that discussion a little bit further if need be during the Q&A. And also during the Q&A, I can also focus on the role of political parties a little bit more, the obstacles that women face inside the political parties and regional variations in terms of women's presence inside these political structures. Um, however, my work in the consulting space looks at recommendations for inclusive societies, for uh, political parties to ensure that there is um, gender equality um, there are several steps that policymakers, practitioners, and assistance uh, providers can take to support gender inclusion in political parties. And of course, these include with, you know, um, beginning with a very gendered political economy analysis by understanding that, um, you know, uh, th that the entry points for political parties uh, need to be gender sensitive. They need to, uh, I, they need to recognize that, you know, we do need to have, uh, you know, causes, depth, and length of these political entry points, and what are they? And um, and they look at the political leadership, look at the economic landscape, socioeconomic within the socioeconomic context, um, and also to conduct gender and inclusion assessments of political parties. Uh, I think this is something that is very important. Um, political, especially when we talk about political transitions. So when we uh, political transitions have uh, seem to give rise to parties that come from different origins, right? So um, as a result, cookie cutter uh, approach and interventions don't work. Um, so we can look at ways to fund and conduct gender and inclusion assessments to identify how formal and informal characteristics uh, of, of party organizations exist um, in any given context and how they will impact party uh, development um, from an early standpoint to the mid development and so forth to the, to the um, uh, so forth. Also offer support for women's groups. So we know that uh, women's organizations um, are usually cut off from the party formation and party agendas. And so if, if there's a way to bring uh, cross-sectional collaboration 
um, and movement building efforts uh, amongst women's groups and activists. It, uh, I think that's also important to ensure uh, to ensure that there is sort of a coordination and readiness when political openings um, happen, when there are these you know uh, windows of opportunities for women's inclusion in the political space, and also to foster exchanges and solidarity between women's movements. Um, in similar contexts by providing very technical guidance on institutional reforms, um, you know, looking specifically at gender quotas and how they can help women's groups clarify their own political demands before formal negotiations actually begin. And so, um, you know, intentional supporting of these autonomous women's groups, both financially and um, substantively, uh, is important because they help civil society organizations become more gender inclusive, uh, you know, um, in at large. So, um, and also to ensure that gender transformative transition actually takes place because during transitions, we know that international actors also should support the active engagement of, of feminist leaders and that in very, um, in, in the negotiating uh, parts of it uh, with, with new government structures and so forth. Also looking at providing targeted support for gender equality, um, you know, during the parties, um, uh, reformation or during early party development is also critical and also by prioritizing sustained party support, of course, you know, support for gender inclusion should continue. Um, and, you know, if there are quotas that have been adopted uh, to make sure that there are subsequent priorities that may include the creation and strengthening of parliamentary women's caucuses and coalitions, autonomous bodies uh, for women in political parties, and of course, party mechanisms that support greater internal inclusion, such as sexual harassment policies or child care support um, and, and so forth. So I believe that the question or the direction of the dialogue should touch on uh, what are some of the ways to accelerate this process? We know that other variables come in play, for example, changing demographics, uh, change in governments with concerted policy and legal reforms, and also the level of strong women and women's rights organizations and movements is key. So there has to be a concerted, uh, you know, kind of a movement, uh, however organic that may be. And as we continue to learn to network and participate actively at the 65th Commission on the Status of Women, I hope that collectively our efforts are able to encourage political commitments, um, adequate legal and policy uh, uh, framework discussions where needed and action items to actually help level the playing field for women in leadership and leadership positions across the sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zia. Um, so now we're gonna move to uh, Dr. Malaga uh, and her discussion on uh, women in parliament. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me um, this morning or night or evening or afternoon, wherever you are, or middle of the night, I hope not. Um, so I wanna start my little overview on women in parliament with, on a happy note. Women now represent a quarter of all members of parliament worldwide. And that's a big milestone. However, if you look at it from a historical perspective, we can see that since 1997, the um, first year that the Interparliamentary Union has data on the women, the percentage of women in parliament, um, this increase has been really, really slow. And if we go at the same pace, we won't see parity. So 50% women um, national, well, women in parliament worldwide, not within the next 50 years. So the other important part to notice is here that I only show you here the number of the women in the lower house. This is because typically in a bicameral system, the lower house is where the political power resides. Thus, from a power access perspective, it's much more important that women enter the lower parliament than the upper house, which is more commonly um, appointed or has regional representation, et cetera, or a lesser policy making role. But of course, there are exceptions, it depends on countries. When we think about the first couple of decades of women in parliament, what we know is that Sweden and the Nordic countries consistently topped the world rankings, having the most women in parliament. However, this shifted in 2004 when Rwanda. Um, 
became the country that has the most women in parliament and has remain, remained on number one of the world rankings ever since. And another important milestone was in 2009 when Rwanda um, for the first time crossed the 50% mark for women in parliament. Now we actually see 61.3% women in parliament Rwanda, which means Rwanda is a majority women parliament, itself a great achievement. And we, we can talk about a little bit why this might be the case if you wanna delve into this in the um, Q&A later on. But let's also look at regions. So what you can see is that there's wide variety between regions when it comes to the number of women in parliament. In general, Latin American countries have done um, better in electing women to parliament than say the Pacific or the Arab states. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia have always performed in the middle and Europe usually has been the second. The numbers I'm showing here is Europe without the Nordic countries because the Nordic countries are outliers in Europe who have consistently elected around 40 or plus percent women to um, parliament. So if we look at the individual countries in each region, in 1997, what we can see is that in the Americas, Argentine performed the best. In Europe, it was the Netherlands. In, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa it was Mozambique, in Asia, China, in the Pacific, New Zealand, and in the Middle East, Syria. So it is a wide range of countries in here in different political system. But what we can see is that the 30% mark is really where most of those regions capped off. Let's compare it to today. So the first thing that we can notice is that now the best performing countries in each region are in a completely different percentage range. Now we're really talking about 40% plus. Um, and the type of countries who are now performing very well has also changed. So now in Latin America, we have Cuba, which might be a little controversial because Cuba is not a democratic country, but for the purpose of numbers alone, Cuba is doing um, is as of majority women parliament with 53%. In Europe, it's Andorra. In Africa, it's Rwanda. In Asia, it's Timor-Leste. In the Pacific, it's still New Zealand, but we can see that New Zealand has increased um, almost doubled their percentage of women in parliament. And that has to do, among other things, with a switch in electoral system, which I'm happy to geek out about later if you want to. And then in uh, the um, Arab region, we now actually have the United Arab Emirates that has 50% women in parliament. And again, I'll come back to that example. But we see that there's progress definitely also in each region. However, again, process is slow. Um, but, but Latin America and Europe generally perform better than other regions when it comes to women in parliament. So let's look at the current world rankings. So what we can see in the top 20 um, of women in parliament is that there's a broad array of countries. It's not from one specific continent only, but really from very different regions. So one of the first questions we should ask is, are there some things that these countries have in common? And the first thing they have in common are electoral gender quotas. For one, they are reserved seats. So Rwanda on this list is the only country that has reserved seats, which means that 30% in the case of Rwanda um, are reserved for women. So these 30% seats in Parliament need to be filled with women. Um, other countries have reserved seats too, and it doesn't have to be 30%, it can be any percent between 10 to 50%. And there are different mechanisms to fill those um, reserved seats. Again, I'm going to spare you the details, but just know that there are a lot of different ways. Then the second type of um, quota are can le legislative candidate quotas. Essentially, this is either a constitutional or electoral law that dictates that women need to make up a certain percentage of candidates nominated by parties. So they either need to be a certain percentage on party lists or a certain percentage across the districts in a country. The final party um, quota is a voluntary party quota where parties themselves commit to quota saying, we are going to promise to 
nominate 30, 40, 50, 15 percent of women every election. And what we can see here that the great majority of those countries that perform very well when it comes to women in parliament actually have electoral gender quotas, one form or the other. You can also think about gender quotas in a different way. So in 2020, we had 57 elections, 25 out of them had used some form of electoral gender quota. Those countries with electoral gender quotas elected on average 12% more women to the lower house and 7% more women to the upper house. Um, Latin America in generally performs very well when it comes to gender quotas. Um, currently, 16 out of 18 countries have elect some form of electoral gender quota. Most likely it is a candidate, legislative candidate quotas. And we see can, um, one form of a quota in over 70 countries today. There is no specific trend on which region has more or less quotas. However, we can see that in Latin America, as I mentioned, we see mostly um, candidate, legislative candidate quotas, whereas in Europe, Voluntary party quotas are more common and Africa, Asia and Middle East sees, sees a lot of reserved seats in general. So another important um, predictor on how well countries do when it comes to women in parliament is the electoral system. So the question on how votes are translated into seats. And research here has showed over and over and over again that the single most important factor in explain, increasing the number of women in parliament is the presence of a list proportional system. This is an electoral system where a party wins the vote on the proportion, it seats on the proportion of their vote. So if a party um, wins 30% of the vote, they get 30% of the seats. Another electoral system that is really performs pretty well when it comes to women in parliament is our mixed member system. So that's a combination between proportional electoral systems, so list PR, and first past the post or majority systems. In that case, the country such as the UK, picture the UK is split in single member district where in each electoral district one um, representatives is being elected and whoever wins the most vote in each district wins the seat and that's how you get to the certain number of seats for each country. So a combination of list PR and first past the post um, also influences positively the number of women in parliament. The system that performs the least best, that's probably the worst I should say, um, is the first past the post system by itself. And again, tons of um, reasons for that. And we can geek out about it in the Q&A if you want to, but I'm going to leave you at this for now. So really what I want you to take away here is that quotas matter and electoral system matters. A lot of the time we also talk about cultural, condition, um, cultural context or socioeconomic conditions. However, what it does is that especially socioeconomic conditions often increase the pool of like the women are able to run for office, but it doesn't necessarily translate to those potential candidates become candidates and then those candidates become elected officials. So this is where from running for being willing to run to running to being elected, this is really where institutional factors are much more important. Similarly with cultural context, very important. It makes it more likely that parties might be willing to take the risk of nominating women or voters might be more willing to elect women, but in the end, institutional structures are usually the more important part. And then to close out here, I wanna highlight two um, important or two interesting cases. So Liberia, as um, Farida already mentioned, ele elected Sir Ellen, Sir Liv Johnson, not Sir, Ellen Zerliff Johnson as the first female president in Africa. But at the same time, Liberia has a really low number of women in parliament. Right now, it only sits at 11%. They, the country did adopt a 30% legislative gender quota. However, it has struggled ever since 2014 to really reach that quota target. And 
this year they re um, voted down an amendment that would strengthen the quota. So that's an important part. Some countries really perform well when we think about um, women's cabinet position or heads of executive, but they might not do as well in women in parliament. The second example is the United Arab Emirates, where it shows that if there's political will, there is a way. So in 2018, sorry, in 2019, UAE was at rank 85th in the world. Today, it is number three with 50% of women in parliament. Why? Because President Shai Khalifa decided that um, women's participation in politics should be a priority and required that 50% of par parliamentary seats should be allocated to women. So this is an example that when there is institutional and political will, mountains can be moved. But unfortunately, most of the time there is no political will or the political will is average. Um, I'm going to leave it at that and we and turn it back to, over to Pedro. Thank you, Dr. Ock. Um, so, so what I'm gonna do right now um, is, I'm gonna start with a question, uh, you know, given where we are today with the one year anniversary, roughly of, uh, uh, of COVID, uh, the, of the pandemic. Um, I'm gonna start with a question about COVID. And what I'm gonna do with this question, I'm actually gonna type it up on, I'm gonna paste it to the, to the chat so everybody can see it. It's a long-ish question. Um, and, and in the meantime, as, as there, uh, and this will be open for any, any of you to answer. And in the meantime, if anybody in the audience, any of the attendees wants to start asking questions, uh, please type them on, on the chat and we'll try to answer as many as possible uh, that come from there. We also have a few other questions from uh, the audience that were sent prior to this, but I, I, I really wanna try to prioritize those who are here who listen to the conversation and may have some specific questions uh, or broad questions about the things that we uh, we have discussed so far. So so here's the question, I'm, I'm gonna copy and paste there. Uh, so the, the UN document, uh, the gender snapshot 2020 uh, is, is detailing the progress of sustainable development goals. Uh, states that COVID-19 could erase many hard won gains uh, in uh, women, uh, in, in world's women's representation, uh, women in general, actually not just representation, but uh, uh, women in general. Uh, how do you think the COVID pandemic uh, will affect women's representation in the executive, legislative, and inside political parties? Uh, what are some of the challenges and opportunities you have observed this past year? And again, understanding that this is unfolding, you know, uh, uh, our research takes some time to, uh, to actually uh, go from uh, collecting the data you know, testing hypotheses and, and theories. Um, it, it really is an observation of what you're seeing, anything that you, that you see that as a possible pattern, uh, you know, or, or any other conversations you have had beyond academia in terms of activism and things like that too. So I will uh, um, mute myself here and I let the, um, uh, the panelists uh, share their, uh, their thoughts. So, um, Jennifer Piscopo at Occidental College and I just recently completed a COVID-19 and gender leadership report for UN Women. And in it, what we found is that women in leadership, we have all seen the narrative, do women perform better during COVID? Um, actually, what women excelled at was disaster management and communication. So there are really three elements on what to do in, a, in crisis communication offer specific guidelines, be very concrete and precise, work with the experts, um, show empathy and make, and make sense of this crisis from a historical perspective. It just happened that women were really good at doing this. We think about Merkel and we think about prime minister in New Zealand, um, but it's also important to know that women were not the only one doing it very well. There were other male prime minister and president who did also an excellent job, such as Justin Trudeau or Macron, for example. But what was so unique is there were so many men, prime minister and prime minister, prime ministers and presidents who really had disastrous responses to the pandemic that it really sh sh um, shone a light on women as being particularly competent. And this might be a shift towards seeing women as competent leaders. 
but whether this extends in the future and to other crises, we don't know yet. Um, I'd like to weigh in on that just a little bit. Um, I think, you know, one thing that we've seen um, systematic differences on for men and women is the way that the pandemic has impacted their personal and professional lives. And there is a myriad of ways that um, the pandemic has impacted women differently than men. And I think that this is really relevant to a broader conversation that we have about women's representation. So I know it was mentioned some in the first presentation that um, women bring different perspectives to office. And there's quite a bit of research not related to the pandemic that shows um, that women do have different life experiences. And when they're present in office, they're really important for shaping the agenda and for nuancing legislation in important ways that affects the lives of women. So even though at the end of the day, um, we may see women women and men have similar voting records when they vote on legislation. It's really in the crafting of legislation where women's voices are so important. And so I think especially with uh, seeing the pandemic have different impacts on women's lives and men's lives and um, makes different things salient for women in their personal and professional lives than for men. I think to, the, to this degree is where we really have the propensity for women's representation to make a difference in crafting policy responses. And so I even just think about simple things like um, responding with the COVID relief packages that produce you know, economic support for families across countries. And in the United States, for example, one of the changes that we saw was with the child tax credit being distributed on a monthly basis instead of at the end of the year, right? And so anyone who's paying for childcare knows that it's going to be a lot easier to pay for childcare if you're getting support on an monthly basis than on um, an annual basis, right? And in the United States, of course, we have very bad policies for child care, uh, for parental leave, um, things along these lines. But this was a really major gain, I think, for families um, that came in part because of um, the economic stress that was created because of COVID. And so I think, you know, we'll still see this unfolding as we watch um, legislation be crafted in response to the pandemic. But I really think as opposed to just looking at, you know, sweeping things like the number of bills or the number of days until um, a representative closed down their, their state or put in place mask mandates. Um, a lot of the work that needs to be done is in looking at the nuance of legislation and seeing where women's voices uh, shaped the crafting of legislation. And also building on what Tiffany just um, so eloquently said is if we look across the world, we really see um, women on local levels, like elected officials on local levels stepping up. So in India, a lot of local council women actually prioritized needs of women. So one checked in on making sure that breastfeeding mothers had all they needed in terms of nutrition during the lockdown. Others instituted um, regular um, cleaning of um, streets, distributing um, sanitizing products to families. Others um, made sure that in the Philippines, a mayor um, trend, um, asked so, um, hair, no, not hairdressers, um, people who sew cloth so clothing, you know who I mean, um, to switch from clothing, which they were no longer able to do because of the lockdown, to sewing masks. So um, an, another person in a local councilwoman in India hiked up all the way into remote villages to deliver food and supplies to them. So I think also, even though women on the executive level have received a lot of attention, I think there's a lot of things going on on the local level where women are really going above and beyond to deliver inclusive and comprehensive COVID relief responses that really consider the most marginalized and also women's in, um, needs. Something that uh, uh, Dr. Ock uh, uh, mentioned earlier that, you know, that the disastrous response from some men uh, uh, led to, uh, uh, you know, the highlighting of, of women's uh, um, uh, response to this. I think that's a very important uh, thing to, to, to discuss too in, this, in the context of women's representation, but also in terms of gender and politics, right? Uh, and I think um, if you look if you look at the list of the worst countries, of course, there's geographic reasons, demographic reasons for that. 
But if we look at the four worst countries, they're all led by populist men, right? Uh, so masculinity and populism is also something that needs to be addressed. And hopefully, you know, in this, there's there's good research coming up on this. But I think uh, I think this 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 uh, COVID crisis really shone a light on 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 the importance of addressing populism again right wing and left wing populism i think you know if, if any mexico here is an interesting uh, uh, important uh, co contribution here because it's not just about right wing populism it's about populism and masculinity right and kind of the messages that come from there uh, and i think it's that, that these discussions are important to kind of also shine a light on the other side of it right uh, uh, where you know women and women's empowerment is important, but also addressing how men perceive themselves and how men lead uh, uh, is important as well to kind of hopefully change some of that dynamic as well. Um, let's see. So uh, there's a question here. Uh, uh, I'm going. I'm going to go ahead and read this question uh, from from Julia, I believe. Uh, in Canada, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau expressed his plans to appoint 50% of cabinet seats to women, while the list of qualified candidates were mostly men. Which begs the question: How many of the women appointed were appointed solely on the basis of sex? How do we justify granting positions of power to people based on anything besides qualifications? Uh, I would open I'd up. I'd love to, to hop in. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really really important and really great question, right? And I just think it's so unfortunate that we're just now asking this question because for decades, we sat back and watched white, old rich white men be appointed to cabinets um, in countries across the globe and never questioned their qualifications. And, you know, we can do a side by side of the women who are appointed to cabinet positions under President Biden's cabinet, for example, and look at the men who they are um, following from Trump's cabinet. And we can see that the women who were appointed um, to Biden's cabinet have far more qualifications than the men who held those positions before them. And so, you know, I would be um, just astonished to think that in a country with a population of 37.59 million people, we couldn't think of 15 women who were qualified to hold cabinet positions. Um, so I think, you know, this is so important to talk about qualifications and we should really be raising these questions all the time. But unfortunately, this question so often gets reserved for women and we hold women to double standards and we expect them to be qualified in ways that the men who hold the same positions simply aren't qualified for. And so um, I really thank you for bringing this to the forefront. And I think that this is gonna be a really important thing going forward, especially you know when we look across developed countries and we see that women are um, graduating from higher education at um, greater rates than men. And the women who do go on to hold the most prestigious positions in the private sector and the public sector are consistently held to higher standards than men. And so it's no surprise then that when we look at how women perform in office, we see lots of evidence that women are actually better policymakers across a large number of indicators, not just um, in legislatures, but also in lower levels of government. And we see, you know, in every study that's been looked at, at the qualifications of leaders, women have at least as much qualification. And in every study that's looked at how effective leaders are, women are at least as effective, if not more effective. You know, and these same trends hold when we move beyond politics. So women surgeons, for example, have higher survival rates than do male surgeons. And it's because when women come on the floor, we like to ask, are they qualified? But too many times we stop short of asking whether or not men who hold these same positions are qualified. So this is a great conversation to have. And I'm sure that my colleagues um, have additional thoughts to share on that. I mean, just to, to touch on what's already been said, I think, I think that there may be a narrative out there that somehow it's a zero sum game <laughs> that you can't be qualified and also have an added benefit of maybe being able to diversify political institutions. And I think that what we've seen with women's portfolios is that they bring both to the table. They can add diversity because there are very few women at the table in general in many of these places, but they also have the experience to hold these positions if we were to define, define them by the types of education that they had or the types of professional occupation that they, that they were a part of before coming to the government. And so in my field of women heads of state and government, what I found is that women are no less educated or no less 
politically experienced. And in fact, often women become heads of state and government after they've been political activists, after they've been legislators, after they've been cabinet ministers, and, and men are often politically experienced as well, but aren't necessarily asked to have all of these experiences from all of these different um, levels, right? And then depending on the region, it may also be demanded that you also come from a political family. And so even women who have those political family credentials, they understand that they also have to have their own political careers apart from their families. And often men have come in to positions of power having been the sons of, can you imagine in the case of Canada <laughs> or in the United States being the sons of former heads of state and government. But we don't question that as much as when you have a woman who has a family that's politically tied to the state. We often go right to, well, she's just the daughter of, she's just the wife of. But what we really find is that at least in this day and age, you have to also have this, this really long portfolio to even be considered, or maybe you even have that and it's not enough to close the deal. And so some of the narratives I think um, like it, are even perpetuated by other women though. So when I was doing field work in Costa Rica and I was interviewing people about the first female president of Costa Rica, Lara Chinchilla, and I was able to interview her too, what was her excuse for not having women in the cabinet? It was, there weren't women. And it's just like, in a country, there weren't qualified women. In a country where there was at one point in time such a high percentage of the parliament or the, the chamber of deputies were occupied by women, it was just very striking how that kind of gets repeated, this whole mythology of a lack of qualified women, I think ends up um, reinforcing these beliefs that we have about men really being the proper um, people at the political table and women, if they are there, they're there because other people decided that they needed to be promoted for reasons that had nothing to do with their qualifications. So if you want to get a um, panel of political scientists railed up, talk about qualifications in politics. And I also want to add something here is like we assume that qualification is neutral, but qualifications or what counts as a qualification is a very gendered um, concept. So what does it mean to be qualified for political office or for corporate boards? Um, does it really have to be the traditional path to power? Do you have to be a lawyer or businessman? Um, or a journalist, or does um, activism in the field running a nonprofit give you the similar experiences or diverse experience that is equally needed? And I always say, like, I want to work for the time when mediocre women have the same chance as mediocre men being elected to office. And I saw um, Susanna's e um, question here from Denmark. And Susanna, I, I'm just going to say briefly here that one of the reasons that Denmark or Scandinavia no longer does as well in the world ranking is that the, the Scandinavia has never moved from voluntary party quotas to legislative quotas. And a lot of the countries who have now overtaken um, Scandinavian countries have adopted legally binding quotas with rank order and sanctions mechanism that are really important. And sorry, um, I mean, I know you wanted to say something. I think you unmuted yourself. Yeah, I know. I just wanted to add a little bit to this discussion. I think that's so important when we talk about qualifications. Um, I, I want to add that, you know, I come from a, a congressional district 11 North, North Carolina, where my congressman has absolutely no experience, and yet he holds an office. Um, so, you know, so instead of talking about, okay, what are his qualifications, um, you know, we, it's very striking that the conversation has, has taken the direction of um, what justification. So we are now justifying, you know, why uh, he, uh, the congressman should be in office because he has no qualifications. So this is just completely mind boggling where everyone knows that there are no qualifications, but now we, we're, we're watching these justifications come out. Um, so, uh, so again, there is a very 
um, heavy burden placed on women when we talk about, you know, the criteria and qualifications. And, you know, you mentioned uh, corporate boards and boards of nonprofits and so forth. Um, so the culture and the trend is changing. But I, I did want to make a very quick point to our discussion that, you know, regaining economic momentum after COVID-11 pandemic is not going to be very easy, right? So uh, from the economic perspective, you know, COVID-19 has demonstrated that the gender ga gaps uh, do impose very real cost uh, on society. And it is estimated that women's lagging participation, as we talk about justifications of, uh, you know, things and so forth and, and um, uh, so forth, that the women's lagging participation in, uh, in employment and entrepreneurship costs will cost the world about 15% of GDP or 26% by 2025. Um, you know, if we look at the full potential of the scenario, so steps towards gender equality could help us um, and will help us on our way to economic uh, recovery. And so this is something that needs to be highlighted. This is something that we need to focus on. Um, also, you know, with the COVID-19 research, uh, you know, in applied psychology has shown that women tend to be preferred over men as leaders during times of poor organizational performance and uncertainty and, you know, being more effective beyond just the moderate level organizational crisis. Um, so there are, you know, potentials and, and I'm sorry, I think my internet keeps going in and out. <laughs> um, I apologize for that, but uh, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, the, the, the burden does fall on women when it comes to uh, criteria and so forth, and, and those negative perceptions and those socioeconomic, cultural, uh, you know, uh, nuances and all of that, that's something that I hope that with COVID-19 pandemic, it, you know, all of those are highlighted, and we hope that as we work towards recovery in our, of our systems, that we do take that in account so that as we move together, forward, we're working towards more inclusive societies. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, you know, I, th I think just going to reiterate some of the discussion about qualifications. Uh, uh, yeah, this um, and COVID-19, I think, has shown us too, like the what what exactly are the qualifications needed to, uh, uh, you know, to to not just run a country, but, you know, again, we got, always got to think about the local level as well, uh, uh, you know, and the, and the kind of uh, of skills needed to, to be able to, uh, um, you know, do these things with empathy and thinking about everybody. So, of course, talking specifically about women here, but, you know, this discussion about qualifications is the same uh, in the context of minorities. And, and, and this goes, again, minorities uh, in different contexts of, um, um, you know, different countries that will have different contexts for this, you know, discussion of minorities. Uh, you know, in, in the context of Brazil specifically, uh, you know, there's always a discussion about, uh, um, you know, we have uh, affirmative action quotas in, uh, in higher, higher education, uh, you know, and, and even though the, the research constantly shows that people who come in through affirmative action quotas into higher education perform better uh, as well or better than those who, who don't, the, the discussion of qualifications continues, the narrative of, of asking about qualifications continues because it is, it is, you know, it is a race, it is a gender issue, it is a class, it is a social class issue. And again, in different countries will have different you know, dynamics on this, uh, but in general, this, the narrative is, tends to be um, the, the target changes depending on on who and who is trying to challenge the established institutions right and established leaders uh so that's something that i think it's important to uh to kind of bring out um so there's a question here uh from margaret west that i think would be a good one to have a discussion to so i'm going to share this with uh with all uh, all the panelists panelists attendees here let me make sure that uh, yep so this question is specifically about uh, campaigns Right, so how do you see the differences in how women conduct political campaigns compared to men? How are different behaviors perceived by the electorate? Campaigns are usually used to scrutinize candidates and the criteria for men and women are often very different. How do you think we can change the conversation or focuses uh, of these campaign processes? Uh, again, I think this is probably open to any of us who want to, who want to discuss. If, if you don't mind, I'll take the first go at it. I think that, so in the, in the studies that I've done, you know, so I think the question that has to be first asked is what's the nature of the position? What's the type of campaign? And probably the most personalistic types of campaigns are going to be presidential campaigns that are for, you know, presidencies that are really important, like not ceremonial leaders, but for example, like the president of the United States or the president of Brazil. Um, you're going to see a lot of personality discussions. Um, what I think has come out in a lot of the narratives of women of women heads of state 
and government is this strategy for trying to balance. And what I mean by that is there are definitely some traits that we attribute to women um, as being maybe more compassionate or being able to bring people across the table together. So being consensus, consensus seeking. Um, there's a stereotype of women being more honest, for example. Um, and at the same time, you know, having to balance this with being very clearly strong, right? And being decisive. And I think women in particular are going to have to walk this delicate walk um, because we stereotypically view them as, as too soft. And if they're not too soft, if they're, they're very, um, if they're very aggressive, then there's going to be some sort of cost to that too, right? Like if, if you're thinking about someone like a Margaret Thatcher and Indira Gandhi. And so often women have to walk that, that, just that delicate balance, that tightrope that um, in, ends up bringing in maybe some compassionate empathy, honesty, at the same time that you're very that you're very strong, that you have decisive action, and and I do think we have higher expectations placed on women. So somebody had had also mentioned this, I think, in the the chat box. But because we some of the stereotypes that we hold women to are essentially you know some traits that I think we could value in a leader if they fall from what we view women as being strong at, like being more compassionate, being more empathetic, being less corrupt, they may, they may end up paying a higher price for not being perfect. And I think a lot of our research, I know Tiffany's explored this as well, Pedro and I have just written a book about this, um, about, well, if, if the female president of Brazil isn't perfect um, and is going to be, viewed as, you know, having more moral authority over something that's as endemic as corruption is in Brazil, then you pay a steeper price for it, even if you did nothing really wrong, especially comparing yourself to, fem to, to other male presidents that have been in power. Um, so I think women often have to create a balance that's almost impossible to achieve. And then, like, speaking from the German experience, so um, Germany, as many other countries in Europe, have um, part of the electoral system is list PR. So in a list PR system, a lot of the time it's a party centric system. So people vote for parties, not specific candidates. So I couldn't tell you growing up who my representative was on the list, um, the list part of the electoral system. So in that case, and that's why you see um, list PR systems being so much more beneficial to women because women on lists do not necessarily have to um, walk this tight rope um, between being competent, but being also female, but not female enough that it um, um, neglects their competencies, right? Um, so if there's political will on the side of the parties to nominate women on lists, you can actually see more women being elected to parliament. And once they are elected, they can normalize women being there and what it means to be competent as a woman or just generally as a human being, I want to say. Um, when, we, when it comes to the chancellor election with Angela Merkel, what was really interesting is that when she was taking over the um, party leadership, she was really considered frumpy, not fashionable, horrible haircut. A car rental um, company even did um, a convertible ad with her, like her hair all stood up and saying, oh, cars are so fun and you can drive so fast. Your hair stands up like Merkel's, right? Um, and then a celebrity hairstylist came to her rescue and gave her the haircut she still has today. So the hair, um, I think the hairstylist passed but she still has the haircut. Um, and then she also simply now um, only wears pantsuits and that's what it is, it's a rainbow of pantsuits and nothing else. Um, so a very standardized almost uniform to allow to take away focus from her looks to what she actually is doing and for her, for her it has been successful. And one thing that it always gives me goosebumps there's a whole generation, maybe even two generations of German kids who have grown up never ever remembering a male chancellor. All they have known is a female chancellor. And I grew up 
only knowing Chancellor Cole as a chancellor. And I remember how disorientating it was to see a, after 16 years to see a different person, another man in the chancellor position. So imagine how disorientating it must be for those kids now to see potentially a, a male chancellor. See, goosebumps. I want to add a little bit to, in a way, bringing it back to all the conversations that we had so far. And something that's very important, and it goes back to some of the questions, you know, that, that came up in the chat too, like, what do we do? How do we kind of break the cycle? Um, so it's important to remember two things, uh, you know, if you look at every single presentation here, this research is new because women in power is new, right? Uh, this used to be, you know, uh, uh, a unique circumstances and, you know, sometimes even, even an oddity, you know, and now we're finally having enough numbers. And honestly, we have enough numbers to now do quantitative analysis, right? Uh, uh, for a long time, this was, these were case studies, uh, which are important, right? But, but, but when, when it comes to like how society accepts, you know, information, uh, 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 can be can be complicated, which is a whole other. There's a gender aspect to that as well, right? You know, in, in the context of who is in power, who is not. Um, so I think it's important to kind of remember that as well. Uh, both, you know, as academics, we are having these discussions always, but I think it's important to activists, you know, and for people in civil society who want to continue this conversation is that, you know, one of, one of the ways to, to continue it is to question, right? Uh, and now we do have women in power. Uh, uh, and, and again, I think going back to, the, I think what Dr. Ock mentioned at one point now that one day mediocre women uh, will, 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 will be just, uh, you know, be just like mediocre men, right? Uh, and I think that's an important thing to think about too. Like we just don't have enough women and they become over scrutinized for this. And again, this goes, again, also there's an intersectional aspect to this as well. Uh, I know somebody on the, on the chat mentioned you know, uh, people with disability, you know, disability studies is, is becoming thankfully more and more part of the of mainstream uh, social science in general, uh, you know, uh, minorities in different contexts as well. That's something that's important to think about. But again, if we only know one kind of leader, um, uh, seeing a new one is always, uh, it, the culture takes a while to change you know, and there will of course be backlashes towards that change, you know? So, um, so I, I wanna, um, we have some, some questions so I wanna kind of continue the conversation, but I wanna bring that up because I think it's important to, to ground ourselves sometimes uh, in a way to be optimistic, right? In this context, right? You know, you know, yeah, things don't look great, especially with COVID and all the things that uh, uh, kind of again reasserted some gender inequities that we have. Um, but honestly, if COVID happened 40 years ago, this conversation wouldn't even be had. We're not, not going to be having this conversation. It would be a, a very like silo conversation and not a mainstream conversation, which I think is happening now. We haven't seen more and more of that today. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left, about eight minutes left. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll open up for some final remarks from, from any, anybody who wants to, you know, kind of contextualize something else they talked about it. I think it's maybe a good, a good way, way to end this. Uh, and again, thank you all for, thank you all for being here. And the, the, the chat has been great, a great conversation to chat as well. Uh, and thank you all the panelists as well. But uh, um, so let's go ahead and uh, 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 final remarks and comments. I'll just say briefly, you know, I, I say all, all the time that institutions matter, institutions matter, institutions matter, and they do. Here's the thing. I'm not 100% convinced that women aren't still hindered by discrimination. And I feel like as a political scientist, one of the things that becomes really difficult is to, to adequately examine the ways that overt stereotypes, overt discrimination, or even more subtle types of stereotypes and discrimination, how that may still hold women back from being elected, from gaining appointment, or even seeking power itself. Thank you. And um, for our, like the final thoughts, I think I want to echo what Farida says and build on this, because um, in the US specifically, in some other countries now, we have a discussion about political ambition, the idea that women are not political ambitious enough, and that's why we don't see women. But I think we need to think about political ambition in a different way, and Shauna Shamas has done a really good job at framing this idea by saying every, there are, political ambition is affected by a cost-benefit analysis. And it might be that women and men are equally politically ambitious, but their costs to be pursuing a political career are much higher for women, whether it's from sexism, racism, ableism, ageism, whatever it is, 
And then in addition to care responsibilities, politics is usually a triple burden because you have the domestic sphere, you need to work often work outside the house and then also a political career. So how do, do the triple burden, discrimination, harassment, the experience you have, maybe a more hostile reception by your local political party to your interest, affect the ambition of women? And it might be that those ambitions are affected very early on when um, women are st still girls. So I, I think my plea would be move away from women are not ambitious, but rather ask, why are they not ambitious? Why don't we see those ambitions? What structural systemic discrimination exists that limits their ambition? If I can, I just wanted to add to that and build on what both of you guys said that, you know, when we talk about women's participation, I think that something that we also need to look at is, um, you know, women between the ages of 18 and 49 um, you know, according to a recent Pew Research study indicated that there are barriers to their participation outside of institutional structures, right? So for example, childcare, um, things of that nature, um, you know, primary caregivers. And so we, when we talk about women's participation in the public space, we need to um, really work towards the, uh, the structures, the institutional structures to include ways for people, for women, to engage, especially for uh, women who are serving as caregivers, whether to the elderly or children and so forth. For example, this past election cycle, we uh, observed that in North Carolina, specifically in Western North Carolina, um, you know, because of COVID, a lot of the campaign um, engagement happened via Zoom. And so with that, more women were able, more mothers, more caregivers were able to actually engage in their political party meetings and so forth because, you know, because of technology. So moving forward, we need to really kind of figure out how do we leverage technology and innovation to make sure that we are more inclusive of women within all spheres of engagement. Because as we mentioned today, it starts from coming to your party meetings, engaging, making yourself visible, um, you know, and then of course, you know, moving up the ranks of the political party and, and so forth and party nominations. So it all starts from a very basic entry point. And, and I think that we have that ability now, it's been highlighted because of the pandemic that we do need to harness the potential of uh, technology and innovation to, to ensure that we have more access and entry points for women. Thank you. Great, so I'll take the um, final word and just to, um, I think the kind of capstone on what everyone has said um, is that we just need to constantly be reminded why this conversation we're having is so important. And, you know, research upon research shows that diverse groups perform better. Diverse groups come up with more creative solutions that serve broader populations. Um, we see research from uh, the private sector that shows that diverse corporate boards have higher earnings. They outperform homogenous corporate boards. We have research from political science that shows um, that diverse parliaments um, perform better and that by increasing women's representation, we increase the overall competence of the parliamentary regimes, right? So I think keeping this at the fore, it's not just about normative concerns about including women, but everyone wins when women win. And having more women and more people from underrepresented groups in our democracies um, allow us to make better, better decisions, to have better performing economies, and it serves everyone's best interests. So I'm just so happy to see us having this conversation and to see, um, you know, to be among these de devoted scholars who really care about advancing women's rights, but also um, such a large group of panelists who are interested in understanding how we can continue to make gains. Um, so thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you everybody for attending uh, this uh, panel and, and thank you again all the panelists for, uh, for this engaging conversation. Uh, and again, for the, for the attendees, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, we're, I think we're all fairly easy to find uh, on the internet. Um, so yeah, you know, and uh, I definitely don't want to be that guy who has the final word on <laughs> women's empowerment uh, and, and and discussions about that. So, uh, so I'm, I'm just glad I'm glad to be invited to be the moderator on this. I'm I'm, I'm always humbled to be uh, uh, with so many uh, great women scholars and, and and powerful women. So thank you. <laughs>